Bibles out and turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, we'll start there. Let me begin by just saying thank you for being here today and for the opportunity to be with you. Look forward to this. I always enjoy being with young people. I get to work uh, camp in Alabama, which was just a couple of weeks ago, the, the Florida College camp there, and that's the highlight of my year. And uh, this, this, these kind of weekends are second to that. And so I look forward to getting to know you and to spending time with you uh, and uh, our time together. While it will be brief, I hope it will be good. In Matthew chapter 22, the Pharisees come to Jesus plotting that is another way to trap him. And in this time, they even send the Herodians, which is ironic if you understand the history here. And starting in verse 16, it says, They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And do you not care, and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard this, they marveled. They left him, and they went away. What, what is Jesus saying here? And you can answer out. What does he mean? Render to God the things that are God's. What's he talking about? Any guesses? His creation? How can you render his creation to him then? Okay, giving him our service and our time and our devotion. When he brings out the coin, what does he ask the question of? Whose image? Or whose icon is on the coin, right? Who bears God's image? We do. We bear God's image. We are created to be image bearers or icons of God. Now we all know that, right? We all, we'll get there in a minute, but we all remember Genesis 1, let us make man in our image, right? Since you've been little, you've been taught that. What does that mean? How would you describe to me what it means to be in the image of God? Have His characteristics? Okay. What are those? Okay. The behavior? I mean, we can, but i got to be honest, if there's one thing I've failed at all my life, it's behaving like God. Like, I understand why we say that, right? And I get it, but how many of you have perfected that yet? Right? Because even with the people I love and know, like my kids, I, I don't love them the way God loves me. Right? I struggle with that. This idea of being made in His image is really hard to quantify. And this morning I want to share with you maybe three things from really rooted in the creation story. You could be turning back to Genesis. We'll get there in just a moment. We'll actually be in Exodus 20 for just a moment, then Genesis 1. But I want to just talk to you this morning about what it really means to be made in the image of God. Not in the sense of that we have arms and legs and God has arms and legs. And not even in the sense of that God has emotions and I have emotions. And all of those things could be talked about. I mean, the reality is we know God doesn't have a physical body. But at the same time, we see God personified through those ways in other texts. And so there's something to be learned from that. But I want us to look at something different this morning that's helped me understand what it means to be an image bearer of God. And I see this broken down in a couple of ways. And we'll get to that in a minute. Think back to the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 concerning images. And look there starting in verses 4 through 6. In You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now God makes it clear not to make what? Images. Idols. You don't make an image to represent me. In ancient culture, there is more here than just the idea of a carved God. Ancient kings, they they saw themselves as an extension of their gods. They, They made images, yes, but in addition to that, they presented themselves as deified forms. And because Jehovah God knows that the people are going into a land surrounded by pagans and have come out of a land surrounded by pagans, He makes this declaration, you don't be like these people. Don't make for yourselves images like God. Don't declare yourselves to be God. Don't be like the world around you. But the other reason for that is that God has already made images of Himself. Right? God doesn't need the golden calf. Why? Because I am the image of God. And rather than these inanimate images that would be taken and stolen, you may remember the story of the ark? Remember how the story of ark in 1 Samuel 4 is taken away by the Philistines? You remember that? One of my favorite stories as a kid because it's taken away. What would happen is they would take the images when you beat somebody in battle and you would take their idols and you put them into your God's temple like a trophy case. That's what they do with the ark. And what happens? Their God the next morning is face down. Right? And they set him back up in the temple of Dagon. And the morning after that, not only has he fallen down, what's happened? He's broken. And so that's how they treated things. And by the way, Israel deserved the ark to be taken because they treated it in that chapter like what? Like an idol. Because they said, we lost because our God was not here. And they bring in the ark, and the whole ground shakes. You think about all of that, that God doesn't need images, whether it's the calf or the ark or any of those things, because He's already made Himself images. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, we mentioned it earlier, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God made man in his image. Now, that language there in Genesis 1.26, means statue. In fact, that same word for image is used in reference to the Baal gods of the Old Testament. God is literally saying there, I have already molded my statue to represent me. It's you. And sometimes, by the way, what happens with us is that our statue or our iconography or our imagery for God sometimes is good And sometimes it is not so good. There's a story of just this type of thing from a town in New York, which happened to be the hometown of Lucille Ball. And they had a statue commissioned for Lucille Ball. And this is what they got. Now, I I don't know if your generation is familiar with I Love Lucy because I grew up with that on reruns already. I'm not that old, guys, okay? But honestly, if you know Lucille Ball, this looks a lot like Steve Buscemi and not Lucille Ball. And now you can't unsee that, those of you who know who Steve Buscemi is. And so later that was replaced with a much better representation of Lucille Wall. Lucille Ball. And I got to tell you, when it comes to being the image of God, sometimes I look a lot more like a representation on the left than the right. Sometimes my statue presence, my iconography for God is not quite what it should be. 
Am I a good statue? Am I a bad representation? Am I a bad image of God? Dean McBride said, the unifying image in humankind has a sacramental as well as an essentially corporal function. Adam beings, or also known as human beings, are animate icons. Well, now that we know that we're animate icons, well then, how do we bear it? Let me give you three ways that we bear the image of God this morning. The first is as a prophet. In fact, I will tell you what we're going to look at this morning is that throughout the Bible story, it's interesting that the Bible story focuses on these three roles. And there's a reason for that, is that when God talks about us being born in His image or, or created in His image, He expects us to act in these three ways as image bearers. And this is the best way that I can think of that. First, prophets. What's a prophet? What's a prophet? Okay. Somebody who reveals God's will. You're no longer allowed to answer questions because you get them right on the first time and it ruins participation. So you're in time out. Because usually in a class like this, somebody goes, somebody who predicts the future. Prophets don't just predict predict the future. Prophets just are really mouthpieces of God. They reveal God's will. They just speak God's will. And sometimes that's in the form of a prophecy. And most often we think about a prophecy because usually the warnings that come from prophets are about the impending doom and destruction that is going to happen because of the sin and evil in the world. But not always are those true prophecies. Think about Jonah when he is sent. He is told that if you don't repent, you're going to be destroyed. And they weren't destroyed. Why? Because they listened. That was still a prophecy. Prophets revealed the will of God. And therefore, a prophet's not just a fortune teller. He's a mouthpiece. Moses, by the way, was a prophet. In Exodus chapter 20, Look at verses 18 through 19. When all the people saw the thunder and the flashes and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. They are saying to Moses, you be the prophet for us because we're afraid of God. You go up on the mountain, you talk to God for us, you come down the mountain, You talk to us, we'll talk to you, and you'll go back and forth. You'll be the messenger, you'll be the prophet, but we're not going to do this. Who was supposed to be a prophet in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3? Who was a prophet in the first three chapters of Genesis? Adam was. And we don't think about that. But what did God tell Adam that was important about life in the garden? Don't eat of this tree. You can eat of any tree you want, except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that I like to call the tree of death, because it's just easier. Knowledge of good and evil is a lot. Right? Sometimes I don't understand why it was written this way. Like, you got the tree of life, and you got the Tree of knowledge, good and evil, that causes death. Why not just make this simple? I'm from the South. We can't do long words. <laughs> Biggest word we know is mayonnaise. Okay? So you can eat of any tree you want except for the tree of death. In Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent is there, who does he talk to? Eve. He talks to Eve. And Eve knows what? That she can eat of every tree except for this one. How'd she find that out? I'm going to assume from Adam because she's not alive when God tells Adam that. I mean, if we're going to believe the chronology of the story... She's not even created yet. And sometime between the time that she is created and the time the serpent shows up, we don't know how long that is because there's nothing in between really, she's asked about this tree and she says, we can eat any tree we want to, but this tree right here. Now, we're not going to dive into the rest of chapter 3, but I want you to notice that Adam did his job up till that point. He pretty much as a failure of a husband in chapter 3, and that's a whole other class. But he tells them this, and he fails to fulfill his role later on. He's already told her this once, but in Genesis 3 and verse 6, when she shows the fruit to him, what should he have done? Been a prophet again. He should have said, No, Eve, 
God said not to eat of that tree. But he failed. He failed to be a prophet. And of course, that leads to what? It leads to sin and separation from God and devastation brought on mankind because he had the message of God, but he failed to give and present the message of God. He had a responsibility to be that messenger. Secondly, image bearers of God are kings, and I should have put this on here because I have two daughters who call me misogynistic for not doing this. Kings and queens, okay? I've got those daughters. Or rulers, if you want to, to do that. Oh, I pushed the button too far, and now you're cheating. You know what we're going to go next. Look at Genesis 1 and verses 26 through 28. Go back again. We've read verses 26. We've read verse 27. Look at verse 28. We didn't read that on purpose because we're going to get to that now. God says to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the flesh of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Have dominion over everything on the earth. What does it mean to have dominion? Another big word, I'm from the south. It means to rule or to reign over, to be kings and queens. Man was made to be rulers over all of creation. And we are this physical ruler. And, and I think you don't need to overlook that because what God wants us to do is He wants us to be the image of Him ruling over His creation. We are a reflection of His rule and how we rule over creation. That's the, the intention from the beginning. And yet, again, we didn't do a very good job over that. But the rule should be manifested with justice and mercy just like God has. We should be a manifestation of that. Then thirdly, as we've already seen the, the preview, priest. Now, priest is a confusing word for us today. Because we don't really think about the priesthood. And when you do, I think it's a little confusing sometimes. What's a priest though? Because sometimes people use priest to basically refer to their preacher in some groups out there. That's not what we're talking about. What's a priest? An intermediary? Okay. Anybody else? What was the job of a priest? What would they go to the priest for? See, you understood prophet and king, right? But priest, what is that? We think about the Levitical priesthood in Scripture. We think about sacred service in the temple ground. We, we think about the connection between the divine realm and the people of Israel. You went to the tabernacle, later the temple, to be able to approach God. In fact, you could not approach God under the law of Moses truly without going through the priesthood. That's what was required. If you wanted to make an offering to God, you went to the priest to make the offering to God. And that's the same, whether it was you wanted to make a burnt offering for worship, or whether you wanted to make an offering for sin, you went to the priest, and the priest assisted you in being able to make that offering. If you wanted to connect to God, that's what you had to do. Now, one of the things that's interesting to see throughout Scripture is that the temple, the tabernacle, and later the temple are all really patterned after something much earlier in Scripture. And that's the garden. Now, while it's never specifically stated, I want you to think about the tabernacle, and especially later the garden, uh, the temple, excuse me, in relation to the garden. The walls of Solomon's temple are adorned with what? Carvings of trees and plants. And in the holy place, there is this series of lampstands, not just one. What do lampstands look oddly similar to, do you think? Trees. And not only that, there's this area at the back called the most holy place where the ark sits, right? And, and what is on the veil 
to the most holy place? You remember? Scary warrior angels. Cherubim. Cherubim. Which, by the way, I don't know if you realize this, like, we think of cherub as this cute little angel. Like, cherubim are scary. In fact, the first time you ever read about a cherubim is where? Genesis chapter 3, where God places a cherubim at the entrance to the garden with what? A flaming sword that does what? Goes every which way, the scriptures say. Like, it's not just a flaming sword. This thing is like spinning or something. Like, I don't know if you thought about that, but that's pretty scary to me. Why do you think it is that the most holy place is guarded by cherubim just like the Garden of Eden is guarded by cherubim? Because the temple is patterned after the garden and the story of man. And once a year, the high priest would enter back into the presence of God or what we might even call the garden where man once walked with God through the veil guarded by cherubim. And I say all that to say if the Levites and the priests were there at the temple, we see that connection already. But I want you to see in Genesis chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17 some language that normally we would just read over and it would have no impact on us and we'd go, well, that's not a big deal. Who cares about that? But I want you to read with me starting in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, there it is again. But Much easier, tree of death. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall eat from the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. This phrase, to work and to keep, are important. The word abad means to work or to serve or to worship. And the word shema means to keep here. And the only two places in Hebrew, or the only other places, excuse me, that these two phrases are used together, these two Hebrew words, is always in connection to the description of the priesthood and the Levites that work in the temple. And we're not going to read that this morning, but if you look there in Numbers, all of those passages refer to the priesthood and use this same wording and language saying to work and to keep. So the role in Genesis 2 and verse 15 that God gives to Adam to tend to or to work and to keep in the garden is the same language He gives to the priesthood in the temple patterned after the garden. And so what we see is from the beginning, we have seen what this, this morning in Genesis 1-3? through We have seen that you're supposed to tell or be a prophet, tell the Word of God to others, just like Adam was supposed to. And you're supposed to rule over creation. You were made. One of the first things said after, let us make man in our image is, rule over the earth. And you're to be a priest. Prophet priests, and kings. We live in a world where everybody seems to struggle with who they are. This is who you were created to be. Prophet, priest, and kings. Now the sad thing is, is the Bible is just filled with man's failure in this regard. Man fails miserably. I mean, Adam and Eve failed in all three of those roles. They, they do a terrible job. And in the garden there, God's living with them, helping them develop. He has this tree of life and He's giving them wisdom to develop as prophet, priests, and kings. And yet in Genesis chapter 3, part of what's going on there is we don't want to wait on God for wisdom. We're going to get it right now through the tree of knowledge and good and evil. So we got a shortcut around God's plan to teach us how to be in these roles. We'll do this on our own. That's what the serpent's saying is, hey, look, God doesn't want you to die. He's not saying He's going to kill you. He just doesn't want you to be like Him. He doesn't want you to be as smart as Him. But you eat of this tree, you can be better than God. You can have all of that wisdom and knowledge without having to listen to Him and take all of these years that you have to live here and do that. And so God removes them from the garden. 
puts that angel with the flaming sword going every which way to keep them out. And he makes their life difficult. Man's going to sweat when he works. Childbearing is going to hurt. But more importantly, they're no longer with God and they're no longer with the tree of life. But you know what God expected still after all of that? For them to be prophet, priests, and kings. And when we see these three roles that dominate the Bible story, we see some filling two or three of these roles. I mean, you think about Melchizedek, who becomes the gold standard of priest king. So much so that in Hebrews, he's the standard Jesus is compared to. In Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of the Most High God. He was a Canaanite man who believed in Jehovah, who was a priest and was the king of his people. What about Moses, who's seen in all three of these in Exodus 19? He is certainly there with Aaron, who's the high priest, but he becomes the lawgiver for Israel. He becomes their prophet and their ruler and their leader. He's a type of king before Israel had any kings and before they even had judges. What about David, who is seen as all three? And I think sometimes we don't realize that. But in Acts chapter 2, Peter calls David a prophet in verses 28 through 31. What about a priest? He wasn't from the tribe of Levi, but notice some things that we see connected to David. When David brings the ark to Jerusalem, notice how he's described in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6 and verse 12. It was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Verse 13, and when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps... He sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of a horn. Here's David wearing a linen ephod and offering sacrifices while leading the ark back to Jerusalem. Like a priest. David, a man after God's own heart, we are told. Who? yes had some terrible parts of his life and didn't always make the best decisions, but we see him fulfilling these three roles. And what's interesting is that the Bible story is filled with people attempting and failing to fulfill all of these roles. I mean, the reality is that sin is not just missing the mark, like we often say, and not just immorality. Sin is really failing to live in these three roles, to be prophet, priest, and kings. Even the nation of Israel itself, under the law of Moses, was told that they were to be a priesthood to the nations around them, showing the other nations who God is. And God expected them to be mouthpiece or prophets, sharing the goodness of God and glorifying Him. And they failed. So over and over again, we see people just like us, created in the same way, and failing to live up to expectations. But thankfully, Jesus comes. And Jesus is the only one to ever fully live these three roles. Turn over to John chapter 14 with me. John 14, starting in verse 6. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and is it enough? It is enough for us. And Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you still not, do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does His work. Believe me that I am the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the amount of the works themselves. 
Jesus says to them, you see God through me. In fact, He says it's impossible for you to know me and not see the Father. Jesus so clearly reveals the divine in flesh. How? In Hebrews chapter 7, and starting in verse 11, the Hebrew writer says, Now if perfection has been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? rather than one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah in connection with that tribe. Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who's become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of indestructible life. For it is witness of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Like his father David, Jesus is a priest and a king. And he is after the order, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. A priesthood that is based on his indestructible life, just like Melchizedek. A priest forever. A priest through which perfection could now be attained. And the difference between David and Jesus is, is that Jesus is perfect in keeping the law. Jesus never rebels against Jehovah. Jesus never gives in to the flesh and seeks what He wants like David does. And in doing so, Jesus becomes the only perfect image bearer of God. But here's the great part about that. Is that because He did that, He makes it possible for us to return to who we should be as image bearers as well. Romans 8 and 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we all, but the Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches his hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to what? Be conformed to the image of of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers, and like those whom He predestined, He also called, and those whom He called, He justified, and those whom He justified, He glorified. Because of what Jesus has done for us, coming and living perfectly in the flesh, and offering Himself as the sacrifice, and being raised from the dead, we can be conformed to the image of Jesus. We now can be the ones that the world sees the Father living in us. We can be image bearers, living icons, animated statues like we were created in Genesis 1 to be. Prophets, priests, and kings. And that's why Peter describes us as a holy nation and a royal priesthood. Because that's who we are. So how does this impact us? How does it make sense to us? We are made in His image. What does that mean? That means it's my job as a living statue to go out to the world and present His message. But more than just present His message. To rule with justice and kindness and mercy. And to help the world learn how to approach God and how to worship God. And how to see God. I want you to know something those of you who are the target this weekend. This applies to you too. This idea of being prophet, priest, and kings, the living animated icons of God, is not just for adults. 
This is not something I expect you to grow into necessarily. Like, I don't think you're the future of the church. I think you're the present. The right now. Because the reality is, for some of you, you have an ability to be prophet, priest, and kings in places with people that I will never have the opportunity to. And never underestimate your power to do that. You are made in His image. So glorify God with your life. Glorify Him with the way you live. By the way, that doesn't mean that you have to carry your Bible everywhere and hit people with it. Okay? That doesn't mean when we talk about being messengers, mouthpieces of God, prophets, that you need to go, repent or God will destroy you just like He did Assyria. No, that's not what we're talking about. Living like prophet, priests, and kings means living with compassion. It means not only loving the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, but living the second commandment. To love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, if you want to know the secret to really being a good prophet, priest, and king, it's really found in how you love and treat other people. And you can do that. And that's the greatest way you can show God to the world around you.